Shadow Man. There's a darkness coming. Shadow Man holds a special place in my heart. It was a coming of age title for Nintendo as much as myself. Big N cast off the shackles of family friendly entertainment during the Nintendo 64's lifetime. The N64 was a rebellious bad boy console, and it ushered forth a period which many fondly refer to as the golden era of gaming. Turok 1 and 2, Conker's Bad Fur Day, Quake, Quake 2, Doom 64, Duke Nukem, Perfect Dark, and, of course, Shadow Man. Nintendo welcomed these edgy mature titles with open arms, and N64 enthusiasts rejoiced that the console was finally fit for mature gamers, to the amusement of PlayStation owners. Shadow Man pushed the outer reaches of acceptable content, even for Nintendo's progressive taste, a straining at the boundary of environmental and visual storytelling. Shadow Man had to compromise, but was no less memorable for it. I first saw Shadow Man on the glossy cover of an N64 Gamer magazine. Each screenshot deepened my obsession with this intriguing new game. The wait was torture. I bought it on release and spent the following weeks lost in an insane world full of suffering, killers and voodoo. A dead side world. The tagline on the N64 Gamer magazine referred to Shadow Man as nightmarish. That descriptor is an understatement. Shadow Man has always been an odd duck in that it defies neat categorization. Its horror is... different. The concept of Shadow Man is based on a comic book series, but you don't need to read the comics to enjoy the game. I debated whether to include the comics in this analysis and decided against it. They do explain the backstory and lore, but the game doesn't draw hard enough from the source material to need explanation. It can be enjoyed on its own merits. Night Dive Studios, that team of renegade restoration experts, resurrected the Voodoo Warrior with the release of Shadow Man Remastered. They didn't stop at a texture touch-up. Lighting, controls and cut content are also updated to streamline gameplay and entice new audiences. Does this 22-year-old title hold up under the discerning scrutiny of modern gaming? Do Night Dive's updates offer anything significant for Voodoo veterans? With the N64 title as my guide, I dive deep into the dark places long forgot to find out. A quick note, from here on I'll refer to the characters Michael Lewa and Shadow Man collectively as Mike. Shadow Man isn't an alter ego, Mike is still Mike when he becomes the Lord of Deadside, with all the memories, fears and emotional bruising that come with being human. I'll refer to the game as Shadow Man. It begins with the first movement of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. An odd choice of music whose use becomes clear as we're introduced to Jack, Spring Hill Jack, Jack the Ripper. By his deeds is he known, and they are truly bloody. What better music for the bitter self-reflection which Jack has lost in? Jack is a hearty thrust of the knife away from his own end, until a stranger interrupts the ritual. This is Legion, for he is many. My name is Legion, for we are many. Legion is the game's chief antagonist who lays out a vision of the future, a vision of victory, a vision of apocalypse. Legion is an unsettling villain. Well dressed and well spoken, his apparent affluence is offset by the unnerving dribble of blood which trickles over his lips and onto the front of an otherwise pristine pinstriped vest. The moment he speaks, we listen. Merely an explorer, much like yourself. There is power in that voice, a terrible knowledge, an otherworldly experience which mocks the frailty of the human condition and its simple existence. Then I would have you build a cathedral to pain. A place where you and I and others like us may join together. Legion is more than a title. The proof is in his voice, which is, itself, a clamour of voices, a sinister cosmic echo. Who is this man? Is he human? 
Legion is more interesting as a character than the plan he relates to Jack, to build an asylum for all of the misunderstood individuals, so that Legion may gather the Dark Souls unto himself and raise a powerful army to bring about Apocalypse. I'll cover the story soon, but the opening cutscene perfectly sets the mood of what follows. Sombre music, a dark theme, disturbing images, serial killers, a place called Asylum, and an ancient prophecy begging to be fulfilled. I no longer think of Beethoven when I hear Moonlight Sonata. This has been Jack the Ripper's movement for over 20 years. You soon get your first taste of the world, a brown Louisiana bayou. You're also treated to the protagonist Michael Lawar's thoughts on his predicament. Mike is resigned to his role as voodoo hitman from across the veil. Can't live, can't die. Red Pepper, Mike's voice actor, breathes deep chesty life into Mike slash Shadow Man. The perfect rumbling tone for a sombre character. Part poet, part hood. Mike's duality also encompasses his speech, which draws comparisons to warrior poets like the samurai. Mike's inner poet is tied to the Shadow Man and the horrors of Dead Side. That comes soon enough. Character models have an exaggerated quality, the sort of exaggeration commonly seen in animated cartoons or comics. Broad shoulders, thin torso, legs and arms. It's no coincidence that the style mimics the Shadow Man comics. The severity fits the theme well and gives Shadow Man a unique and memorable appearance. The starting area is sparse on threats and eases you into character movement. It also sets expectations. Exploration plays a big role in Shadow Man's gameplay. This is more than a run and gun adventure, which becomes more apparent when you travel to Deadside. The place where all souls go, without exception, after death. First impressions of Deadside hit like a runaway truck with its brakes burned out. You arrive thigh deep in a large pool of blood, surrounded by walls that look, rather eerily, like necrotic flesh. Harrowing wails fill the air and decrepit corpses rise from the liquid around you. They are dead, but they are very much alive. They scream in agony as you shoot them, ripping soul from body in a pop of cadaverous chunks. These things are all disturbing in their own right. Then you're hit by the sucker punch to the gut. The realization that these creatures are people. Vessels for souls more accurately, but the wails of pain are real. This is a tortured existence, and it awaits all who pass through the veil. Jaunty, the guardian of the Marrow Gates, is just around the bend. If you don't think this place resembles a large corpse, take a look at the Marrow Gates. The adventure begins beyond that ribcage, through the twisting maze of sallow passageways, mini hub areas and primeval puzzles. Shadow Man boasts a semi-open world whose secrets you'll slowly uncover over the course of the game. Much of it is locked so that exploration is not just encouraged, it's necessary to progress. Dark souls are the quarry and they're strewn across Deadside, stitched inside pulsing vessels like blood candy. Exploration is key, and you'll open the paths one lock at a time. As you navigate the twisting labyrinthine passageways, you're assailed by the despondent soundtrack and wails of the dead. A great sense of isolation and mystery are constant companions on this journey. Nothing here is familiar, it's downright unsettling. And that tunnel you took leads to more forks in the road. Is this the right way? Were you better off hanging a left instead of taking the right? This is a common question throughout most of the game. No decision is a bad one though. Shadow Man understands the nature of exploration and it understands player expectations. No one likes reaching a dead end with nothing to show for it. Deadside's partially hidden tunnels and obscure pathways always go somewhere. It can seem deliberately confusing and obtuse to begin with, but it's hard to argue against the design when exploration is rewarded with Cado, Govi, new powers or new areas to explore. Shadow Man is the explorer's wet dream, and it's always baiting you with the promise of items and power. You might be lulled into the role of gawking pedestrian during the early hours of the game, soaking the sights and locations without paying close attention. You'll regret it later. 
Shadow Man's environments may look like arbitrary window dressing, but new abilities mean access to new areas and treasures. You'll look at the game world differently and realize how densely packed it is. Deadside isn't an open necropolis waiting to be plundered. It's filled with blood falls, fire blocks, fire floors, molten pools, drum gates, skin walls, warp points, architect locks, pottery, govy, and the restless dead. For a dead place, Deadside is very much alive and brimming with stuff. The original Shadow Man games came with a fold-out map, which is conspicuously missing in Shadow Man Remastered. Do yourself a favor and print a copy. Coffin gates act as leveling roadblocks to ensure that only a Shadow Man of sufficient power may pass. Coupled with the map of Deadside, these gates offer a passive push in the right direction, and they control the flow of play. Don't have enough power to open a coffin gate? Revisit explored areas and collect more Dark Souls. Combat is, at first, clumsy business. Armed with nothing but the Shadow Gun, you'll make a meal of enemies. Mike may be a demigod, but his power is far from its peak. Enemies eat many of your screaming wraith shots before slumping over, primed for the arcing death blow at the end of all things. The wet pop as enemies explode is a satisfying conclusion, and the soul they leave is a welcome chaser after brutal fights. This encouragement to push forward reminds me of Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal, where players are incentivized to see combat as an opportunity instead of risk. This feeling in Shadow Man is subdued, but it's there. A reward for aggressive play and a smart finish. Mike is ambidextrous. He can equip any weapon in either hand. This leads to natural experimentation with weapon combinations. The Shadow Gun doesn't have to be your primary or secondary weapon. Sub it out for something else and push the limits of your voodoo capability. Mike's powers don't remain stagnant for long. Voodoo treasures are scattered through Deadside, waiting to be discovered by the Shadow Man of Prophecy. Most of these artifacts grant access to new areas, but many also function as weapons, capable of stabbing and immolating foes. As Mike absorbs more Dark Souls, the power he can channel into the Shadow Gun increases. From Shadow Level 2 upwards, you can charge the Shadow Gun by holding fire. Enemies don't buff to keep pace with Mike's increased power. They appear in greater numbers. Mike effectively begins the game underpowered and rises into his mantle as Lord of Deadside. Enemies die quickly at high Shadow Levels, often with one or two shots. This creates a gratifying power curve to Mike's progression through Deadside. As you revisit old areas, you get to appreciate the jump in power. Perhaps the most satisfying reflection of Mike's increased power is held in his eyes, which elongate and manifest as the masks of shadows. The effect is subtle. You might not notice it at first. At some point you'll realize though, and I dare you to try and hold back a smile. Deadside is ancient. You won't need piles of book lore to tell you that. Buried among the flesh and pools of blood are the blood temples, former places of power which retain some of their potency, and which protect Govi. The temples were once actively guarded by the Sisters of Blood, but that was another time, a different millennia. The Sisters grew dormant. Only the foolish or recklessly brave dare disturb their sleep, for the Sisters are guardians of Govi, and they see their task through to the bitter end. The blood temples brim with arcane effigies, murals, traps, fire, and power. Govi are often prominently displayed, tantalizing Mike and just beyond reach. Temples are a rite of passage. Your journey through them reflects this. They represent the biggest leaps in Mike's power. At the heart of each temple are chambers which grant permanent health increases or gad tattoos, powerful symbols which are seared into Mike's back and arms, and which bestow a greater resilience to fire. In practical terms, the Gad tattoos open large portions of Deadside, affording Mike greater freedom to explore. Puzzle solving in Shadow Man is light and usually focused on finding a switch or using specific abilities. These expectations are condensed into the Blood Temples, requiring Mike to demonstrate his power, knowledge, and skill. The Blood Sisters challenge Mike at every step. They stand silent, almost respectful, head bowed and shoulders slumped like marionettes awaiting the puppet master. 
It's an eerie feeling to turn your back on their sleeping forms as you go about business. But Mike has enough presence of mind to warn the player when the sister's awake. The sister's awake. Their scythe-like projectiles can turn rooms into bullet hell as they ricochet and circle around Mike. The sisters are best dealt with quickly. They are unique to the Blood Temples, and their appearance signals the threshold which Mike has crossed into these places of power. Prominent locations are spread across a large area, and backtracking on foot is laborious. Thankfully, Mike still has the teddy bear which belonged to his younger brother, Luke. Luke is dead, and Mike's strong connection to his brother allows Mike to use the bear to travel at will between live side and dead side locations. Others, however, can force Mike's hand. If Mike dies in Liveside, he returns to Deadside as Shadow Man. The only punishment for death is inconvenience, excluding the final battle where failure has a rougher outcome. You'll thank the Builder that this travel system exists, especially if you want all the Dark Souls and Kado. It's not only fleshy tunnels and ancient temples which you'll explore. Rising above the bruised Deadside horizon is Asylum, Legion's grand vision come reality. It's a tower of black and arched windows and Sauron-esque searchlights and crowned in swirling soot. It is an ugly place, even by deadside standards, an imposter of metal and iron among the tortured dead. You are unprepared for the cloying bloodied menace which calls Asylum home. Indulgent sculptors of flesh reside here, hook-handed or with growling chainsaw. They tend the hissing machines in their own gluttonous desire for inflicting pain. The lesser creatures of Deadside are playthings in this high-rise of horror, caged and trapped and to be fed to the uncaring bite of chainsaw or meat hook. Asylum is an industrial place, a processing plant of sick pleasure, cold and impersonal. Mike's monologue describes Asylum well. And into Asylum, like a great black engine roaring to eternity, ravaging the already benighted landscape with its savage, malevolent presence. And within the legions of the truly damned, insanity, sheer and stark, and once in human form, now gutted and torn by eons of glutted indulgence, their bloodlust flecking the oily walls, living in the shrieks of victims ensnared, hanged, drawn, and quartered by the serpent's squalid writhings. This is the place I have not wanted to dream of, and the dream is now the place I partly live through. Asylum is huge. Dark souls have found their way here. So there's no avoiding the blood-stained hallways, sterile white slaughter rooms, and unnerving experiments if Mike is to meet destiny. Legion gathers his army and his power here. The display of force is overwhelming at first. But these minions, for all of their ferocity, are only fodder. Travel deeper, and you'll discover the real troops of Legion's army. The true forms. Creatures crafted of dead side flesh and animated with Legion's proclaimed Dark Souls. Although Deadside is neither heaven nor hell, it has a resident underworld in Asylum. This is a place of fire and torture, pleasure and pain, blood and bone, steam and metal. Areas such as the playroom and experimentation rooms reveal the true perversion of Legion's thirst for a conquering army. Shadow Man's horror isn't meant to scare or shock. Instead, it repulses with severe imagery and environmental storytelling. You can only avoid it for so long until it is eventually thrust into you, surrounds you, screams and cries and rails at you. You will learn to embrace the horror as Mike does. Asylum's piston heart feeds the madness of the machines, and it must be deactivated, one piston block at a time. It's no small task. The maddening maze of Deadside applies equally to Asylum, and Mike's power must be great to unravel the mysteries within. The Cathedral of Pain, Asylum's unholy seat of power, allows Legion's army to travel liveside. Apocalypse's ambassadors, known as the Five, prepare for Legion's arrival by sending the living across the Vale in the most gruesome manner imaginable. They are the guardians of the abhorrent portals to Deadside, and the portals reflect the grisly extremes that the Five operate at. 
a severed torso, skull and chest pried open, an entity so badly mauled that it balances on the knife's edge between life and death, parting the veil to dead side but unable to pass over thanks to the artificial life injected by Jack and his twisted artifice. Mike's hunt for Dark Souls and the Five draws him liveside many times. Things change in liveside. Mike is mortal until later in the story. SMGs, shotguns and other lead throwers supplement your liveside arsenal. You feel Mike's vulnerability more keenly in liveside and this heightens the tension when Mike stumbles across the gory remains of a victim. Liveside areas are light on puzzles and enemies. They lean heavily on white knuckle tension to feed the pace of exploration. Liveside is cleverly crafted to allow Mike to advance a little, but not always to the end of a level. Natural barriers like underwater sections prevent deeper exploration, funneling Mike back to the dead side exploration loop to discover ways to advance. Nettie and Jaunty offer advice if Mike visits them. It's often oblique, but coupled with the game map, it's usually enough to point toward your next action. Live side areas feel empty at times, and I wonder if this was for the sole benefit of building tension. It works, but points of interest are too far apart, and a little more action wouldn't have been unwelcome. One thing live side areas aren't empty on is environmental storytelling. Oh my god, no! The atmosphere in some areas is thick and palpable, and the five brandish their brutal handiwork like a jagged, rusty weapon. Skin rugs, skin chairs, skinned people, and whatever this is. This is terrible. Mike often comments on his surroundings, invoking a sense of smell and relating how he feels. Mike's comments make him relatable, and we can empathise with the toll that seeing shit like this must have on his psyche. The horror, the horror, I embrace it. This isn't a trite catchphrase. Mike has little choice but to face the demons thrust upon him, personal or otherwise. In the face of such perverted adversity, what does one do? Many would fall victim to the toll exacted by this harrowing role of voodoo protector. Instead of shying away or shielding himself, Mike embraces the darkness, subsumes the shadow. It undoubtedly has a cost, but Mike chooses to delay payment to be able to function as the Lord of Deadside. No one knows how long this fortitude might last, which is all the more reason to take the five down post haste. You'll need to end them all. Mike's relatable nature plays a pivotal role in the horror elements. Mike tells us how he feels about the world around him, and we trust his sense of things. When the Lord of Deadside, immortal voodoo warrior, is disturbed by the mutilated bodies and hideous slaughter, we empathise. This vicarious repulsion only has power through Mike. He is our eyes, ears and nose. He is our conscience in this world. And we understand that if a voodoo demigod is disgusted, then shit must be pretty bad. This is the power that a vocal protagonist can have. Mike's comments make us slow down and survey the world. They act as prompts, which ask if we're still paying attention. We don't often need Mike's comments to see that things are pretty fucked up. However, throwing in comments like, This smells worse than dead side, is pretty evocative. True to their nature, the five are implanted with dark souls and have become immortal beings in Liveside. There may be five, but there can be only one. And it's your duty as Deadside Hitman to end their terror. Battles with the five offer few tactics. Fights boil down to cover shooting and whittling their health until they stagger, then finishing them with the shadow gun. Only Jack breaks this rhythm by crawling across the ceiling and dropping on Mike from above. But the unique movement grows stale quick, and the fight becomes tiresome. None of it is inspired, and battles with the five become checkboxes to continue. Such a shame, because the narrative behind the five is compelling enough to hold my attention up to each fight. This boss pattern worms its way into the final fight with Legion. His human form is easily dispatched with dodge and shoot repetition, and his second form offers a brief challenge spike until you find your feet, 
then even this fight becomes trivial. Have you found both violators? You blow through him like a hurricane through a dandelion. Perhaps it's just me. Perhaps I'm spoiled by the many completions on the N64 and my familiarity with Legion's attacks. I doubt it though. There's regret in watching Mike jog away from the collapsing asylum as the credits roll. There's a sadness in recognizing that the journey is over, that the threat is vanquished, and that the Lord of Deadside can return to playing bones with duppies and giving bones to never mind. I didn't need this feeling to confirm that I enjoyed Shadow Man. That feeling nestled close to my excitable heart for each discovery, each step in power, each area unlocked. 20 plus years after release and Shadow Man is almost as relevant now as it was back then. The maze of tunnels and paths reflect a different time that not everyone will appreciate, and a lack of hand-holding will turn some away. Then again, if you're not in love with this sort of level design, the eclectic horror themes, unique art style and grim tone may be the kicker you need to travel deadside and see what the fuss is about. Shadow Man is a shadowy title to define. Part shooter, part platformer, part puzzler, part horror, but not quite. The core philosophy of exploration, backtracking and deeper exploration is reminiscent of franchises like Metroid and Zelda. But these are shallow and crude explanations that don't allow Shadow Man to stand on its own feet. Atmosphere and aesthetic are as important as mechanical design philosophies, and Shadow Man's success lies in its ability to merge everything into a coherent and absorbing experience. Congratulations, you win the booby prize. Night Dive Studios, that crazy bunch of keyboard mashing homo sapiens, turn their god-tier resurrection powers to Shadow Man, and this remaster is the result. Once again, Night Dive demonstrate why they are, and should be, the de facto game's restoration team. They have updated many aspects of the original game, but with careful, meticulous sensitivity to the source material. Many textures have HD versions. These aren't upscaled textures. They've been lovingly recreated by hand, and their authenticity is a credit to the artist. Everything has a crisp edge which looks very sassy indeed when coupled with the changes. Real-time per-pixel lighting replaces Shadow Man's old static lighting, and the effect is striking in many places, enhancing mood, danger, and even theme. It's easy to undersell how big a difference this makes. Environments spring to life with these new effects, and they even score Mike's Passage. Piston doorways feel like massive metal teeth, light shining through bars feels like jail time, and the shadow gun illuminates the area when charged or fired. The real-time lighting from Mike's gun trivializes dark spaces, however. Pitch black areas were deliberately designed in the original game, and they had a precise solution. If the torch is a casualty of improved lighting, though, I won't lose sleep over it. Controls are significantly improved over the original Shadow Man. Buttery smooth was my description on Twitter. Shadow Man's original controls felt clunky, stuttering, even back then. You could only move to the front and back or sides. Shadow Man Remastered allows for combination button presses for a more fluid experience, and transitions between character animations is now seamless. Improved movement makes combat easier, but Night Dive caught this in their QA net and adjusted enemy behavior, hit points, and numbers to compensate. Deadside is fuller now than ever and gets more crowded as Mike's powers increase. The music got some love too. Shadow Man's original composer, Tim Haywood, returns for the remaster. The original tracks and sound effects are back in crisp hi fi glory, and new tracks are added. There never used to be underwater tunes, not in the N64 version. Whoops. I need air and quick. I love Shadow Man's music. It's not for casual listening, but it complements the voodoo themes and bleak mood well, and it has a unique voice among the countless soundtracks that I've heard. A big claim for the remaster, and possibly the biggest reason why fans have renewed interest, is the inclusion of all content originally cut from the game. 
We're not only talking new enemies in the macabre scenes that had Sensor's panties in a twist. It includes new areas in Liveside and Deadside. The new Liveside areas change the flow of the game. In the original Shadow Man, Victor Batrachian, Milton Pike and Marco Cruz are all incarcerated in Gardell County Jail. The remaster gives Marco and Milton their own extensive areas, meaning that each of the five now have their own level and Mike must hunt them separately. This feels more organic to the personalities of the five, with each having their own agenda, instead of bundling three into one location. Milton's area, the summer camp in Florida, is an American getaway, replete with communal tables, abandoned cars, alligators and ubiquitous bloodied smears. Milton, it appears, has been hard at work. Dorms, offices and even an extensive cave system await exploration. Aside from the crocs, however, it's as empty as other live side locations. Milton appears midway through the level and this short fight offers some variation from the boss template. Animal traps and an automated turret strive to make combat more interesting. But Mike's tactics don't need to change. The salvage yard has some nice set pieces, like the old saloon which Marco sets ablaze. The trend of empty levels continues though. This area looks more washed out than the rest, like someone scoured the colour palette with steel wool. A sand scoured weather beaten car yard wouldn't look particularly vibrant, granted. But more attention to this area could have made it pop. In a mildly controversial change, the shadow gun has been upgraded to a new model and the firing sound has been replaced with something less... obnoxious. Purists might argue that this is a step too far, and I had reservations about the change initially. But the new gun is a good aesthetic fit. It's more congruent with Deadside and Voodoo. There are quality of life improvements too. A weapon wheel which makes arming our ambidextrous hero a breeze. A Caddo counter appears for each area, streamlining the hunt for collectors. Collision detection is improved and Cado no longer function as solid objects when Mike touches them. This was an issue in the N64 version where jumping onto Cado would sometimes cause Mike to slide off, potentially into hazards or off ledges. In another controversial change, the number of Cado is increased. There are now 666 Cado to find, yes, very clever, but only 500 are required to fully upgrade Mike's health, no change from the original game. I understand that new areas needed Kado, but I don't agree with boosting their number. Attaining a full health bar was an accomplishment for the explorer, for those dedicated and patient enough to find all 500 Kado in a playthrough. Saturating the world in them trivializes this accomplishment by allowing even the mildly curious to reach the same levels of health. Shadow Man's original design made it intrinsically clear that not everyone would finish the game with a fully unlocked health bar and all 120 Dark Souls, and this was perfectly serviceable for the majority of gamers. Is this change part of the original vision of cut content? Possibly. When everything shakes loose, it's a minor quibble which didn't diminish the experience, but that I felt strongly enough to comment on. A slew of updates and patches released after the launch of Shadow Man Remastered, which fixed bugs and tightened gameplay. There are minor issues such as missing textures, questionable lighting and plot inaccuracies, but these issues are overshadowed by Night Dive's studious attention to detail and clear affection for the original Shadow Man. With Night Dive seeking out gaming gems of yesteryear and driving these restoration projects, the end need not be nigh. Shadow Man's cast of characters are interesting, but the story which builds around them is too plain. Mike's directive is clear from the opening cutscene and it doesn't deviate one iota. There's a road bump or two, sure, but these pace the gameplay as much as the story. It was an inspired choice to set the game near the turn of the millennium, when real world prophecies and doomsayers predicted the end of things. Shadow Man's apocalypse grounds the world in real fears, but it fails to fully capture the essence of that fear and reflect its ugly truth back at us. Legion cuts a memorable introduction, 
an impeccably dressed, strongly spoken aristocrat with an unsettling voice and bloody mouth. When he produces a dark soul from thin air, we have so many questions, and the sense of mystery and foreboding builds as he reveals his grand vision. Who is this man? What is this man? Guy Miller, Legion's voice talent, delivers a credible and disturbing villain whose multi-voiced prose echoed in my head long after he stopped talking. The character of Legion has deep-seated roots in the New Testament. There are numerous accounts of Jesus meeting men possessed by demons. When asked what their names are, the men reply, My name is Legion, for we are many. This inference obliquely points to the last time Legion openly interfered with man. It also provides some clues as to the nature of Legion. The private investigator, Thomas Deacon, infers in his report that Nettie had him look for a demon called Asmodeus. But Asmodeus is commonly described as a demon of lust, and this doesn't fit the personality of a man who calls himself Legion. Legion speaks with Jack the Ripper, yes, that one, and we understand that the topic of discussion won't be kittens and ice cream. Unlike Jack's real-world counterpart, he isn't portrayed as a man who kills for sadistic pleasure or to taunt authorities. Jack has purpose, he has direction, he has an end game. If he can't find that here, then he goes where he must. The real Ripper was never caught, and Jack's trip to Deadside bridges the gap between reality and dark fantasy. Jack's acceptance of Legion's proposal doesn't sit right, it's too quick. A stranger arrives with a bag of tricks and Jack is not only accepting of him, but immediately willing to believe all. Let's explore this because I think they could have done more with the plot by better leveraging Jack as a linchpin. Let's say Jack wasn't convinced, that he didn't quite believe, and that he blew Legion's proposal off. Jack is mortal when Mike first confronts him, and after a battle, Mike sends him deadside with old-fashioned lead justice. Jack's death, however, is the catalyst which reunites him with Legion, whereupon he accepts Legion's offer. Jack is sent back to Liveside to recruit more depraved killers whom Legion has already begun coercing from beyond the veil. Batrachian, Cruz, Marx, and Pike are drafted to Legion's army as a direct result of Mike's action. The Jack built asylum is inconsequential. Any architect could fit that bill, and the world is full of corruptible people. Jack could have been a copycat killer, and this would have fit perfectly with the timeline. This would have sprinkled a little paprika over the plot and given Mike a deeper personal investment in ending these killers. It also would have provided a plot twist to hook players. Michael Lewis is an equally interesting character. We learn through cutscenes that he lost his parents and his little brother Luke in tragic circumstances. It's my fault Luke's dead, and mom and pop too. I deserve everything I get, every bad thing that comes my way. What we get is a broken man who has survived on the basic impulse of self-preservation. He has no aspiration, no desire, no shits given, and is resigned to his fate. You empathise with Mike. Most of us appreciate what loss feels like when we are caught by a hole so deep that nothing can possibly fill it. Mike is so far gone and resigned to his role as Shadow Man that he questions nothing which Nettie says. She found him while he was vulnerable and knitted this responsibility into his chest. Was Mike willing or merely compliant? Nettie's backstory is just as shrouded. You learn that she's older than she appears. I suppose you've been away dallying with the old battleaxe, axe, giving her one with some of that religious voodoo so she can stay forever young. It's obvious that she's adept at channeling great voodoo power, though she can never cross the veil to dead side. Nettie is the instigator of the plot, sending Mike on his hunt. She remains an advisor for much of the game, but she has little narrative impact beyond that. If Nettie knew about the Dark Souls, it does beg the question of why she didn't suggest that Mike secure them before now. Maybe return them to the Blood Temples for the sisters to guard? And why are they strewn about the place? It makes sense from an exploratory point of view, but not a narrative one. Jaunty, guardian of the Marrow Gates, is memorable for his quips and sarcastic cheer despite the Tao setting. 
Jaunty acts as the dead side helpline, providing hints if you're stuck. He's an amusing fellow who can always be counted on for a cheap laugh, though he's barely an ancillary character. I wanted to learn more about Jaunty's history, about who he was in life. His enigmatic nature begs more detail, but those pleas go unfulfilled. The detail in the world is fascinating, and I yearn for explanation of the skin yurts, blood temples, and the role which Lower played in the formation of Deadside, among other things. These explanations never came, of course, but a little revelation could have seasoned the mystery, really brought it to the fore. As an exploration-heavy game, Shadow Man positions itself well to tell these stories. Perhaps this is one ask too many, but I was absorbed by the world and defaulted to my base desire, to poke around and learn more. The five are the guardians of the gates between Liveside and Deadside. They mark their territory with brutal displays of barbarism. Their casual disregard for life is chilling. Individually, the five are unique. Each of their areas paints a different, often grotesque and artistic brand of crazy. Victor's calling card is to burst the heads of those around him, though how this is done is never explained. Avery delights in macabre scenes of death which mock life in their serenity. Some still linger in a tenuous state of life. This is terrible. Each killer has a theme and a particular style of death, but the five serve a greater purpose, to challenge Mike's progress and power. They are the harbingers of Legion's impending reign and they taunt Mike to confront them, to grapple with madness. It's written on the walls, literally. It's in the arrangement of bodies. It's in the traps and jump scares and ambushes, each designed to draw Mike deeper into the web. The arrogant self-assurance of the five is their undoing. They fail to recognize or appreciate the threat which Mike poses. It's possible that the power of the Dark Souls have completely blinded their hazy grip on reality. The Five can't stop Shadow Man, not in live side, and their ignorance is surprising. These beings are meant to be the guardians of the unholy gateways to Dead Side. They are tasked with keeping the gateways open and await Legion's true form army to cross the Vale. They are pivotal to Legion's grand plan, being his only physical representatives in live side. Why didn't he arm them properly with knowledge or power, or both? This oversight isn't a failing of the Five, it's a failing of Legion. His lack of care as Mike tears through his Liveside avatars is reckless. The Five are morbidly intriguing, and there's little doubt that their personas and history darken the hue of the story. Even though they feel like checkboxes for Mike to tick, it's impossible to understate the weight that they bring to the tone of the story. New content isn't without its casualties. Deacon's report says that Pike and Cruz are incarcerated in Gardell County Jail, awaiting execution. However, the restoration of content has moved them to their own areas. This discrepancy wasn't identified as part of the restoration effort, or if it was, there's no explanation for how Pike and Cruz managed to reach the areas they now guard. This doesn't affect gameplay or plots in the slightest, it's just an oversight and a point of caution when restoring large chunks of cut content. Legion toys with Mike in Deadside, baiting him at key moments by pretending to be Luke, Mike's dead brother. Mike's desperate need to make amends with his family blinds him to the fact that Luke is not who he appears to be. As players, we know that Luke's bloodied mouth is the sign of Legion's deception. But Mike hasn't met Legion, and isn't aware of the significance. He sees his hurt brother, and Mike's past overshadows his present. Decoy Luke could have had more impact if his true nature were hidden from the player until the end. The bloodied mouth leaves no mystery, no second guesses. Deadside is a strange place, and it's depicted so horribly that even a fraction of hope at preserved humanity is an interesting subplot worth exploring. Mike's pain over Luke's death is clear every time he fast travels, having to relive the memories of family laid to rest. 
Legion's voice murmurs a sinister undertone during these sequences, a constant reminder of his ability to corrupt even the most private of moments. He understands Mike's pain better than Mike does, and preying on Mike's vulnerability is child's play. Once Mike hands the teddy bear to Luke, his ability to go live side is gone. Mike is trapped in his purgatory, a god among the dead. There's a final revelation moments before the fight with Legion where he reveals that he created the prophecies. He also says that he is a god, as far as gods go in Deadside. This information comes far too late. Good plot twists are memorable because they allow the characters and audience time to absorb them, to rearrange the knowledge they thought they knew and apply it to the new context. Legion reveals his masterstroke of genius moments before a boss fight we knew was coming. We don't care about the twist because we're about to kick ass. It also has no narrative weight to Mike. So what if assumptions were made? It's too late to correct them now. Let's quickly examine a plot twist which lands properly in Thief the Dark Project. Garrett's seemingly normal employers, Constantine and Victoria, reveal their true identities. Victoria is a shape-shifting wood nymph, and Constantine is none other than the trickster, a devilish pagan god. The twist is not only unexpected, it comes at the height of Garrett's hubris and blind thirst for wealth. This revelation has dire consequences for Garrett and the world he inhabits. He has handed the trickster an artifact which can be used to plunge the world into anarchy. He is solely responsible for enabling the trickster to destroy the world. This twist happens roughly two-thirds of the way through the story. Far enough that we are invested in Garrett as a character, but not so far that he can't atone for his mistakes. Garrett sets his pride aside to work with his former enemies to set things right, and we get a satisfying redemption arc and conclusion to the story. It's hard to believe that Legion didn't foresee the leap in Mike's power from absorbing the Dark Souls. Mike's power is reflected in the gradual opening of Deadside, Legion is the spider on the wall. It would have been impossible not to notice these changes. I can only think of one reason why Legion encouraged Mike to collect as many Dark Souls as he could. He was hoping for Mike's corruption by their horrible influence. This makes some sense when listening to Mike's introductory monologue for the new areas of Asylum. I feel as though my powers are almost at their peak. The souls within me burn with a dreadful fire that threatens to consume me. I must exercise the utmost care from here on in, or find myself succumbing to Asylum's dark allure. Mike hears the call of darkness, and his resistance is framed as a struggle. It would have been interesting to see this play out in the game as a corruption or humanity meter which altered the ending. Legion never comments on Mike's struggle, so it's unlikely that he expected Mike to fall to the influence of the Dark Souls. Legion appears only a handful of times during the game, and he never confronts or interferes with Mike's progress. During the introduction, we're promised an antagonist who is powerful, charismatic, manipulative, and who has a plan. At no point during the game are these traits demonstrated, however. We're intrinsically told that Legion is the shit, but we never see it, and the end fight does nothing to affirm Legion's omnipotence. Legion is a two-dimensional character. He looks credible straight on, but turn him a little to either side, and you'll see that there's nothing behind him. He could have been, should have been, much more. The story of Shadow Man is serviceable. Not great, not standout, just serviceable. Something to drive the protagonist to a conclusion. This surprised me because I had been impressed by the indelible characters and the memory of my original playthroughs were positive. I shouldn't be surprised. The beats of the game have never stood out to me. The things I remember most were the locations, the boisterous personalities, and the mature theme. Shadow Man is a good example of how characters can elevate an experience, even when the story isn't well written. No medium gets away with this more convincingly than video games. Lord of Deadside. 
One of the more interesting aspects of Shadow Man is its use of voodoo as a central tenet for Mike's powers. This theme is prevalent throughout the game, and references like Mambo, Bokor, and Govi had me wondering how much fiction there was in Shadow Man's voodoo. Voodoo is often portrayed as shrunken heads, pincushion dolls, bloody rituals, and barren samity. The beat of drums, the flash of fire. Count the cliches when you watch any Western media piece that skims a shallow and grossly inaccurate portrayal of the religion. Shadow Man isn't content with surface level depictions. It dives deep into the symbology and imagery in an attempt to faithfully depict things which are relevant to setting or story. I don't pretend to be an expert on voodoo. The following explanations are what I could scrounge together online. Voodoo isn't well documented or codified, which is likely the cause for misinformation and demonization of the practice. With that off my chest, here goes. Haitian voodoo appears to be the primary influence for Shadow Man's powers, rituals, objects, and imagery. Unlike organized religions, voodoo has many branches which differ in practice and tradition. Defining voodoo is hazy for an outsider like me. Creole voodoo is likely an influence in Shadow Man 2, having originated in New Orleans. The prevalence of French words in voodoo requires a brief history lesson. I have to be careful how I word this because Papa YouTube and spanking, so bear with me. Voodoo is deeply rooted in African culture. It wasn't until French migrants settled in the US and the country now known as Haiti during the 1700s that a new form of religion appeared. This new religion included elements of African beliefs, Catholicism and other religions to form what we recognize as voodoo. Although it was initially practiced by the African population, voodoo was quickly embraced by the French, and before long it had as many French practitioners as African. The diverse peoples of this new religion mingled freely and happily, which was a controversy at the time and for many years to follow. French was the dominant language in these regions, and the voodoo lexicon retained this heritage to present times. Shadow men are fictitious protectors, originating in African tribes as protectors of the living from the horrors of Deadside. Comics introduce the titular hero to the world, and the Shadow Man mythos has been built upon through two games and a comic book series. The concept of souls and of the living passing to the world of the dead are common beliefs in voodoo. Shadow Man works both these beliefs into the game in the form of health pickups and the Deadside setting. The idea of spirits inhabiting and controlling the body gave Shadow Man the freedom to explore this as a mechanic of play. Mike's role as taker of souls is accurate to both the character and the voodoo religion. Voodoo masks are common in the practice. They allow the wearer to call upon spirits and communicate with the dead. The Mask of Shadows is this symbology iconified. It isn't just a tool for speaking to the dead, it imbues the wearer with the immortal power of the dead. Many would think these powers are boon, but Mike believes otherwise, and it's hard to disagree with his perspective. Shadow Man depicts the Blood Sisters as priestesses or witches. They are the guardians of Govi, and provide a challenge to Mike as he overcomes the trials in the Blood Temples. I found no reference to them outside the game, so it's likely that they were fictional depictions of a guardian caste. Original concept design for the sisters included African women with Masasi spears. This was clearly an area where creativity took over. Govi, the fleshy receptacles which hold dark souls, are real objects in voodoo. True to their game equivalent, Govi are used to hold the immortal aspect of the human spirit after death. In Shadow Man's case, Govi are reserved exclusively for Dark Souls. I'm impressed that Govi not only exist in the game, but that their representation is fairly accurate. It's not a perfect parody, but it shouldn't be when Shadow Man is a living god. Govi are described as a red clay jar or bottle. If this sounds familiar, let's have a look at Kado. Clay pots are fragile, and I understand the need to turn Voodoo Govi into Kado for use in Shadow Man. This also explains the origin of Kado. The ancient prophecy in Shadow Man, Le Carte, is a rip on tarot cards. While voodoo tarot cards do exist, they aren't canonically used in the practice. 
This aspect of Shadow Man probably arose from the commercial voodoo tarot decks floating around, which have provocative illustrations and a distinct art style. Shadow Man's arsenal borrows objects and themes from voodoo religion and repurposes them. Ceremonial drums, rattles and knives do exist in voodoo religion, but Shadow Man incorporates a more western view of these items, which are often made out of bones, skulls and other questionable material. Their real-world analogues are usually more benign, made out of traditional materials like wood and animal skin. The attention afforded to the detail of these objects is still admirable, and I'm glad that they were included. Veve are intricate symbols which are drawn or traced on the ground for voodoo rituals. They act as beacons or representations of the lower. Powdered material such as cornmeal is typically used to draw the veve. Shadow Man uses veve at key moments in the plot, and the calabash item is used to destroy covers sealed with veve throughout the game. The veve used in-game don't correspond to a real-world voodoo pattern, though they are similar to the designs for Papa Legba, who acts as intermediary between the lower and the living. Loa, traditionally spelt L-W-A, are spirits who act as intermediaries between humanity and Bonji, the divine creator. Over a thousand Loa are believed to exist, with only a couple hundred recorded. Loa are usually given gifts in return for wisdom or healing. Shadow Man doesn't get bogged down in what is obviously a broad subject, and is content at keeping the topic high level. Gad tattoos also have relevance in voodoo. A gad shields the bearer from harm. Real gads protect against bad spirits as much as physical harm, while gads in Shadow Man serve a specific purpose. Coffins and coffin shapes are prevalent themes of voodoo death and resurrection. Shadow Man uses the coffin shape in its portrayal of the gates, which block Mike's progress in Deadside. The symbolism represents passage through varying stages of death's power, and serves to highlight Mike's constant rebirth through his journey. Jaunty is an oddball character. While his role in voodoo is purely fictional, Jaunty is a mishmash of voodoo themes. His lower snake half may be influenced by Dambala, a lower who takes the form of a great white serpent. Jaunty's head and top hat may be a reference to Baron Samadhi, the lower of death an appropriate correlation for Jaunty. Only the Baron may accept someone passing through the Vale, and Jaunty's position as gatekeeper of Marrow Gates loosely aligns with this responsibility. I could make more comparisons, but the point is clear. Voodoo is faithfully represented in Shadow Man, and is a core theme underpinning much of the art, character design, items, and locations of the game. The influence is subtle, but you'd notice if it were ripped out, and player experience would suffer for it. This is the end, beautiful friend. Shadow Man's strong themes and stylistic presentation age well, almost graceful. While muddy textures and dated lighting aren't most people's idea of a good time, Night Dive Studios deftly identified the rough edges and gave them a good filing. The result is crisp, colourful, smooth and freshly appealing. I'll admit that I wasn't confident that Shadow Man could feel new enough to draw me in. I was wrong. Updated controls changed the pace of exploration and combat in minor but significant ways. The naughty mechanical discretions which the original game waggled in your face are gone, and I didn't appreciate how much they impacted the experience until they were fixed. The lackluster story is outpaced by strong characters who deserve more focus, but who do an admirable job with the time they're given. The plot twist comes far too late. No one cares, and the new information doesn't alter plot or characters. Legion does little to distinguish himself as a powerful villain, but it hasn't stopped his bass-heavy voice from echoing in my mind all these years later. The Five are still a creepy bunch of dudes no matter what decade you're in. Voodoo themes underpin the entire Shadow Man experience, often in subtle ways. There's no doubt that this is a big reason why Shadow Man occupies headspace for many. Remove the themes and the experience becomes a generic action adventure. I'm impressed at how faithfully and respectfully Voodoo is portrayed in Shadow Man. Acclaim Studios Teesside, the original developers, did their research and clearly immersed themselves in the Voodoo religion when creating this game. 
Shadowman's focused cast of characters, locations, and themes are undoubtedly the reason people still remember it. There's no game like it, and drawing comparisons only cheapens the accomplishment. It was ahead of its time back then, and in many ways it still is. The horror elements are as repulsive and confronting today as they ever were. The slower, exploratory-driven pace gives players time to absorb their surroundings and immerse themselves in the murky and mature mood. But all of this is inelegant waffle. Shadow Man puts it better than any analysis could. The power of the Dark Souls. I embrace it. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching. These videos are an open discussion, so let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Have you played Shadow Man? What stuck with you the most? Was it an image, a character, a line of dialogue? If you enjoyed the video, do me a blondie solid and raise a thumb. Just click the like button. If my style is your jam, consider becoming a part of the blondie posse and hit subscribe. If you know others who like this sort of content, let them know. The words of my mouth can only travel so far. This is the end, my beautiful friend. I'll stop talking now. Amen to that.